Thanks, Toya. Uh, you on the? We thought we'd just have a conversation for a little bit. Uh, if you want to present anything or talk or show or some uh, show us slides or whatever, pipe up, pop in. Um, but we figured we'd just have a conversation for a little bit, and then uh, folks would obviously want to, to ask you questions and, and get your opinion and whatnot. So we'll we'll make time for that towards the end of, of the session. But I just wanted to, to echo Toya um, and thank you for taking your time to, to be with us here at Researcher's Desk. Um, we all know how busy you are. Last time we spoke, you were gonna chat up Joe Biden afterwards. Um, so so we know that uh, this is really valuable for us. So, so thanks for being with us. Um, so let's just have a quick chat. Johan, I'm curious, uh, in the last year or so, what's what scared you the most about what you see and, and what makes you the most optimistic? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And, uh, and great to be with you and um, really important work that the research desk is doing um, fundamental in this in this really turbulent and, and transformative moment. So yeah, you're quite that there's so much science coming out that it's almost difficult to, to pick, um, let's say, on, on either side. Uh, and it's almost like every day is, is having an equal mix of one more scientific paper showing that we're moving faster than expected towards higher risk. While at the same time, we have more and more empirical evidence of, uh, of moving and seeing momentum towards, um, towards decarbonization and, 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 and sustainability. But I think what I'd like to emphasize here is that what really made me uh, deeply, deeply concerned was the paper by colleagues at INRA and, and, and elsewhere who did this empirical 10-year study of the Brazilian part of the Amazon, uh, showing that You're muted. Let's see, it's it muted automatically here, but uh, but this study shows um, you know quite unequivocally that the Brazilian Amazon has over the past ten years tipped over from a net sink to be a net source. So that that to me was uh, a bit of a tipping point study. The second one is the paper that also came out just a few weeks back, which is the the biggest global comprehensive assessment of uh, mass change in, in all the glaciers on Earth, which now shows conclusively that we are losing mass in the Arctic, on Greenland, very, very much faster than expected in Alaska, uh, dramatically in the West Antarctic. And everyone has read about the doomsday glacier that is now uh, irreversibly sliding down into the Southern Ocean, the Thwaites, glacier, which of course is, is one of these nightmare glaciers because it uh, seems to be a plug to the upstream glaciers in West Antarctica, but also showing that the third pole is now verified as losing mass, not, not as fast as many other glaciers, but fast enough for deep concern because this is, after all, the life support for over 1 billion people in the six big rivers feeding parts of China, Pakistan, India, Southeast Asia. So th that was, to me, a big issue. But then finally, which I, I, I suspect we may come back to in this conversation, is, uh, is the papers that have been coming out in the, in the run-up to the IPCC sixth assessment on climate sensitivity. I think it's uh, something that has been really surprising to me that it hasn't come out much more in the scientific and broader debate that the holy grail on climate science that has stayed very, very stable for the last five IPCC assessments, basically 50 years actually, if you look even further back, that at a doubling of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, we expect something between 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius of average global mean temperature rise, an average of three degrees Celsius, and that the sixth assessment will now show that that range will be narrowed. And it will be narrowed to 2.3 to 4.5. And of course, uh, for, for, for people who, who are not working on this every day, that might sound like, uh, well, so what? That the, the uncertainty range goes from something very wide, 1.5 to 4.5, to something slightly less wide, 2.3 to 4.5. Uh, 
But there are two reasons in my mind to be really, really concerned about that. Number one is that the old uncertainty range goes from something that potentially is manageable, but still very, very damaging, 1.5, to a disaster, 4.5. And the AR6 will show that the range is, in fact, something that is very likely unmanageable or very difficult to manage. I would call it dangerous, 2.3, to a catastrophe, 4.5. Meaning that the range is not, it's, there's still uncertainty, but the range has no escape escape way. There's, there's nothing uh, that we can adapt to in that range. We can only do one thing, and that is stay away. So that, that's kind of conclusion number one. But conclusion number two, which is even more dramatic, is that why is this range so much more narrow? Well, it's not because the climate models are now able to represent nonlinear dynamics and Earth system feedbacks. Oh, no. It's because the models are much better in terms of linking meteorology with climate science high level resolution in representing cloud dynamics and everything that has to do has not to do with permafrost thawing or forest dieback or, or, or abrupt albedo change or sudden shifts in the AMOC in the, in the ocean. So very likely the climate sensitivity is even more severe in, in terms of being kind of working against us. So these are three pieces that I think adds even more scientific support for rapid action. On the good side then, well, there of course, I think the International Energy Agency uh, report that came out last week, uh, it's a bit too early for me to say conclusively because um, my dear colleagues at the Potsdam Institute are kind of digging into the details as we speak. But, but quite frankly, it looks like the IEA has finally turned the corner. It's a 1.5 report, which is really transformational, that does not allow any more expansion of fossil fuels, and that actually stays quite, quite scientifically aligned on all the components, all the wedges, not exaggerating on negative emission technologies or, or behavioral change or energy demand. And I think that is very reassuring and, and positive. And then, of course, on the other positive side is, is to see all the evidence that is now on, on the table on the positive hockey sticks, on the exponential roadmaps on renewable energy. Uh, there we are. I, I can probably, I'm not touching my computer myself. It's kind of self muting. It's, it's, it's getting fed up with me simply <laughs> sitting, it's talking a, it's on a Zoom feature, Johan. It is, yeah, exactly. You come to a certain a saturation point and then zoom starts saying ah 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 no more no more it has to shut up now yeah so anyway back back to you kevin but but i think there i mean i think we all share that that there is this schizophrenia right now that we have almost equal amount of of uh, risk-based evidence mounting as we see the momentum of positive developments mounting so johan i'd like to pick up on that last bit um because one of the things that intrigues me and i want to i want to hear your opinion about this is you mentioned that the transition, for instance, in the transportation sector towards towards electrification and whatnot. I've been noticing a, a transition as well in the financial sector. Uh, and, and just this week, we saw that, that in Holland, for instance, a court uh, ruled that Royal Dutch Shell, at least for their Dutch emissions, needs to, to become much more aggressive in terms of, of cutting down their, their operations emissions and products emissions. Um, until 2030, and and just last week or earlier this week, in fact, uh, a couple of of climate realists, you might say, were elected to the Exxon Mobil board. Um, and among the other motions passed uh, was was Exxon. The board is going to now have to to report on its lobbying uh, and report on how their the board activities are actually contributing towards the Paris Agreement of, of limiting warming to one, one and a half degrees. All of that development is being driven by big hedge funds uh, and investment funds and pension funds and whatnot. You move in that world, Johan. Um, what are you seeing? Do you, do you see this as, are, are we at the cusp of a tipping point there that, that we're seeing perhaps a change in, in the way uh, investment will, will influence how we behave in the future? 
Yeah, and, and my answer is, is actually conclusively yes, we are at a tipping point. And, and let me share with you that in the run-up to the Biden Climate Summit, um, you know, we were several, certainly many more than I know, but we were several having, you know, informal interactions with, uh, with climate envoy John Kerry, uh, you know, feeding in science as, as well as we ever could to, to, to President Biden and, and the summit agenda. We knew that there was a financial coalition being discussed among private banks and central banks and financial institutions. We know that uh, Mark Carney, whom I've been interacting a lot with uh, in, in that context, uh, was, was very you know, optimistic, but, but nothing conclusive. And it was uncertain up until the summit. And then, and then suddenly in the summit, it's announced and, and launched and, and the biggest zero carbon banking alliance ever, ever seeing, you know, the, the, the reality of, of, uh, of, of our situation today, which, which was just put in place and made real in a very abrupt and surprising way. And then in parallel, you have all the uh, efforts, you know, from you know, basically starting with the Larry Fink letter from BlackRock and, and the trajectory from that, and all the banks that are stepping out of, of the whole Carmichael uh, mining investment in Australia, um, basically stepping out of the Adani, the Indian uh, company who is trying to exploit coal mining, new coal mining in, in Queensland. I think there's no doubt that this is the beginning of the end for, for financial investments in new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. And, and we know, I mean, we should not cheat ourselves here. We know that the reason for that is not only that we are making financial uh, institutions aware of climate risks, it's also that it's not making economic sense anymore. It's simply, it's a very nice uh, cocktail of, uh, of risk management and opportunity management. And, and, it's, uh, and it's simply blending in a way that is tipping over. I mean, we're not, we're not, we cannot say it's a home run yet, but I, I would definitely say we are on, on a new trajectory. And the question is, can we move this fast enough? And, and remember that this, this collides with the fact that the carbon price in the European Union is rising very fast. So we have, a, we have kind of several parameters pushing this because if there's anything the financial sector understands is that when costs are rising you back off you move away to to other other turf that can increase profits and and now fossil fuel investments are very risky assets so so here's the cool thing you know the i see that that gives me optimism as well uh, i see more and more uh, large investment agencies and firms sort of realizing that that uh, carbon needs to be left in the ground that, that is a stranded asset still you've got a whole world that has been built on on extraction of fossil fuels and extract the extractive industry basically and and those folks have to have a future too you know, the folks that that have been employed in in that those extractive industries need to have a future and and of course the the opposition uh, has been has always and will continue to make arguments that well look you know we can't stop doing this because we need jobs and, and it's this it's driving the economy and you're going to put people out of work and it's going to be bad um we're at a what what tip how do we reach a tipping point where where we can show the win it's it's not a loss well it is a loss obviously but there are wins associated with that transition, how do we how do we become better at painting the better future rather than simply allowing others to to tell us how much we're going to lose? What do you mm -hmm. think? What, how do we get there? Well, so so if 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 the I, I admit a bit optimistic, but if the conclusion from this conversation is that we've crossed the tipping point in terms of um, let's say the, the the rationale in the financial sector then I think we are right on the edge when it comes to the narrative. I mean, we, we haven't yet tipped in either way. So there is a bit of tug of a war out there on, on whose narrative is going to win. But I see increasingly that uh, particularly representatives from the private sector, so business leaders around the world, are starting to go out in public and talk about sustainability and a zero carbon future 
not not as a responsibility like a corporate social responsibility but rather as as a pathway to competitiveness as a pathway to let's say success profit prosperity equity security and and that's quite interesting that's by the way if you if you look back into the biden summit he never used the word environmental risk or climate risk once in that summit it was all about jobs 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 and of course that's a very political tack but i think it's part of of a new of a new design it's, it's, a, it's a new narrative and and i think we in the scientific community should endorse that very heavily because it has evidence behind it we we have so much empirical evidence today that going towards renewable energy is also a pathway towards more jobs economy that's now verified in most markets in the world but it's also better outcomes in terms of resilience in terms of health in terms of security and and that's um, that's a completely new tack i mean for us who've been struggling in this field in in our whole professional life can see a trajectory from from sustainability being about reducing environmental impacts and even even up until recently talking about you know willingness to pay and uh, and basically almost almost ourselves contributing to this dichotomy between either you save the planet or you save jobs and the economy as if there's a trade off in between to to a point today where this is very rapidly changing and i think we can today really start talking about modern societies um seeing that sustainability is a way of taking the next step in let's say in modern evolution and and of course one sector today that is really on this race in in a very i mean where there's no doubt that they've crossed the rubicon it's in the whole car industry i mean the car industry is in a race to zero and it's not a race to zero to save the planet it's in a race to zero to save themselves to 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 basically survive as a company and and that is quite interesting that that has happened in just a few years and um, and i think that's a that's a narrative that we should you know in a way uh, connect with in in a, in a clever way and start showing that sustainability is is the only way to really deliver and hand over to future generations uh, you know a good life opportunity it's not it's not about uh, only taking responsibility yeah absolutely. it's that as well it's that as well yeah. but it's uh, it, it has a, a much much wider dimension. No, I my own feeling, Johan, is that, that we in the in the research game in the scientific community we've we've been shooting ourselves in the foot for for decades basically by by not embracing a, a narrative that that says we can get to a better future. Mm, exactly. uh, our narrative has been that, that oh the, these risks are you know it's going to be a catastrophe and this is being going to be a catastrophe and you you mentioned earlier. You know, you're, you're quite worried about some of the new results, scientific results that are coming out and saying that, look, things are worse than we thought. Um, that's not the only story. Obviously, that's that's part of a story for motivation. Uh, but that's if that's the only story, we're toast. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's going to be fun to try to figure out how to frame a narrative that is a positive one that, that does give us a future uh, and a good one. Uh, mm-hmm. rather than just uh, a very scary future. Listen, I'd like to switch tax just a little bit. Um, COP26 is coming up in Glasgow. Um, I wanted to pick your brains a little bit from, from the point of view of researchers' desk uh, about the COPs and whatnot. Um, but first, what, what are your expectations from the COP? What would you like to see? Mm. Well, to begin with, of course, the, the, the basic expectation is that all 195 signatories of the Paris legally binding global climate agreement ratch up their NDCs so it aligns with the legally binding target of well below two, aiming for 1.5. I mean, that, that's kind of the minimum that we need to have credible plans for every nation in the world. And um, and not, nothing less is required. Number two um, is, is of course to, to kind of close the books on 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 Article Six and all these uh, technicalities and, and that I just take for granted. But number three and the most important is, uh, and I think we're also seeing some positive signs here, that Glasgow becomes the COP, 
COP1 in terms of integrating the Earth system to the climate agenda, that we finally get a full integration of the ecological crisis and the climate crisis, because we know that the final battleground, whether we land or don't land softly at 1.5, is no longer about getting, getting off fossil fuels. It's not, it's not only about the energy transition. The final, final battleground will be whether we're able to maintain the carbon sinks in, in the biosphere. So Glasgow has been announced by Prime Minister Boris Johnson and clearly declared as, as the nature climate cop. And I really hope that that is what will happen because what makes me more nervous than anything is that, you know, we're lagging behind on the energy transition, but we know that we are also facing an agriculture revolution to have any chance of landing the Paris Agreement. I mean, that's one of the biggest mistakes in, in this whole offsetting and net zero discussion that it's, it's as if climate models land at 1.5 and provides us with a global carbon budget based only on, on, on black carbon, on fossil fuel emissions. But that's not the case. The only reason why it will be sufficient, why it's enough to be at zero on fossil fuels by 2050 is because the climate models have already built into the assumptions that agriculture will transition from source to sink in the next 30 years, which is an agricultural revolution. They have already built in that the world will go from zero negative emissions to up to 10 gigatons per year of carbon capture storage and BECs and different CDRs, carbon dioxide removal technologies. And they have already built in the assumption that there are no tipping points. There are no negative feedbacks, uh, surprises. There are no forest fires or drought impacts or anything like that. Nature just remains our best friend and just continues delivering in a very stable way into the future. All of this is built into the, the, the analysis, which gives us the 350 gigatons of carbon dioxide and remaining carbon budget, which allows us to land softly by 2050. So you cannot say, okay, we will land a bit later by... Uh, investing in protecting the Amazon rainforest. I'm sorry, the Amazon rainforest is already counted into the model. It, it's already considered a secure carbon sink. And now we have science showing that it's not even secured. It might even be you know, a bit uncertain whether we can trust on it. So, so in my mind, there is this uh, necessity to, to be a very sober, have, a, have kind of a sober focus on, on the pace of change here. And that, that's what we are, to, to a large extent, lacking in, in, this, in this discussion. So, Johan, this, this was unexpected, but I, I want to go here with you. So, so you just mentioned that, that you hope the COP is actually going to take a more holistic picture and not just see climate yeah. as, as sort of a physical climate, but we've got, gosh, there's life on the planet. What a surprise. So, so we need to include biology and whatnot. But so far, we have the IPCC, which has been fantastically successful, really, but that supports climate negotiations, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We have the new IPBES, which is supporting a framework on biological biodiversity and, and ecosystems. We've separated those. Um, and obviously, you know, you're, you're one of the people around that, that has said, no, that's not a good idea. Um, how do we this is complex how do we how do we find a, a process an assessment process that that will will give negotiators give politicians give our leaders that kind of holistic sense um what do we do about that we don't have it at the moment well my simple answer is um take the planetary boundary framework and off you go <laughs> no Joking a bit. Well, I'm not joking, actually. I mean, that, that is one of the frameworks that we're, that we're working on very actively, as you know. But no, it's, it's a really good question. How, how do we get uh, world leaders that are um, struggling with, with, uh, with the vertical silos that we're all so well aware of in a situation where we have to truly connect all the systems and act simultaneously on all fronts not in incremental but in transformative ways i mean that that's that's what really makes this um you know raises the stakes so much that even to land paris we need a global sustainability transition to to land kunming we need a global 
sustainability transition. You, you, you cannot decouple these things. But I'm to, to that, that might be a that might be surprising uh, in my response here that I I'm I'm relatively optimistic here. And why why can that be? Well, it's because I think we are apart from um, well let, let, let me draw it in in this way. I, I think the pandemic actually is uh, uh, turns a page for us in this context because. There is one lesson that I think everyone, every citizen in the world is now is sinking in very, very clearly, which is that we are truly a big world on a very small planet and that we're all truly interconnected and that what, what goes wrong in one corner of the planet can go viral across the whole world and knock over the world economy in the matter of, of no time. And that that is... Uh, um, which makes it much more easy today. I mean, we have been talking about this for, for I mean, for, for decades, actually, that we live in a globalized, hyper-connected world. Well, now it's clear to everyone that we are in this hyper-connected world. And I think it's much easier, therefore, for people to understand what, for example, the global commons is. And that global commons is not some theoretical notion out there. Oh, no, it means that you and I depend as much on the Amazon rainforest as the indigenous communities that live off the uh, Amazon rainforest and that we are all interconnected as one global family and that we depend on all the biophysical systems that regulates the state and the livability of the planet. And, and I think that we will come to Kunming, the biodiversity summit, and we will come to Glasgow with, with a kind of a, with a pandem post pandemic glasses on with a much more, with a much higher degree of receptivity to the fact that you cannot just, I mean, some actors still will, but but <laughs> a large enough percentage of actors will not, I think, um, will, will be able to, to be more recipient to, to a kind of a, to connecting scales and connecting sectors. And, and that's why I think there is a, a, a enthusiasm in the business sector today to go from SBTI to SBTN, meaning from science-based targets only for climate, which is a great success, by the way. I mean, after Paris, over a thousand multinational companies have adopted science-based targets to phase out fossil fuels in their companies. Many of those companies are today demanding from us in science, they want the numbers for nature. They want the numbers for the other planetary boundaries because they recognize that these things are interconnected and that they operate in markets around the world and that they depend along their value chains on keeping also biodiversity intact, not only carbon emissions intact. And I think that is a kind of a, uh, a manifestation, a proof that, that we are increasingly able to, uh, to, to have several balls in the air at the same time. Then finally, just to say that it is an exciting year. I mean, we, we, we baptized last year, the super year, and, and uh, of course, the super year was destroyed by the pandemic. But why was it a super year? Well, it was a super year for two reasons. One is that we had a unique set of UN summits, the Kunming Biodiversity Summit, the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and the Glasgow Climate Summit. Also, all IPCC scenarios show that this was the last year to bend the global curve of emissions. So a super year. Now it's been postponed. So we are now in the, 2021 is actually the super year. Not only is 2021 the super year, we've entered the shortest decade in humanity's histories on earth because it's only nine years left. And, and it's a, so it's a super year in a super short decade in the most decisive decades for humanity's future because it's the decade when we have to turn things around. The fact that we have these three different summits, you know, when you think of it, it's the same heads of state that goes to all the summits. So if we, if we play this a bit intelligently over the next months, we, we can have the same leaders, the same human bodies being confronted with, with the nature story, the food story, and the energy story, and the climate story in, 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 um, in a very finite short time span of only four or five months. That's that's quite good. I mean, that's um, it's like like it's like punching someone um, left and right, <laughs> up and down, very intensively in in one. You you know you're, you're kind of fully massaging someone's brain um, in in a very intensive mode. 
And I, and I think that's that's a golden, golden opportunity. It's in fact so golden, it's never happened before. And, and, and you know, I think we are aligning up to take it. One, one risk that I see, we, we've been talking a lot about risk. One risk that I see there, Johan, though, is, is and I agree with you, this is, this is sort of unprecedented that all of these leaders will be attending or hopefully will be attending these different conferences. What we've done thus far, though, is, is at each one of these things, we, we tend to, to say this conference is the most important. And then three months later, it's this conference that's the most important and the one that's even more important that's going to come in another three months. Mm. I'm hoping that you and and folks like you are are going to be able to say that these collectively are the important thing that, that again you can't have you can't take one in isolation from the other they are all connected as you've said um, and that we we need to be coming up with solutions that are as at least as connected as the problems are no you're right i mean that that is a that is certainly a risk that that each summit gets isolated and and um and, and that that has to be and i think that's why um you know articulating as we as we try to do as as, as actively as possible of talking of of this as a super year it is uh, the transition point it is a decisive decade it's the decade when we need to cut global emissions by half it's the decade when we have to start halting biodiversity loss it's the, it's the decade where all the talk all the promises all the rhetoric all the regulations all the signed agreement must start delivering and um, and i think i think we stubbornly have have to keep that that tack and then of course a, a little piece of, of good news here is also that we learned a lot in paris or rather we started learning in copenhagen when when we realized how bad it can go if we just leave politicians alone three o'clock in the morning in a very badly organized the Bella Center in, in, a, in a wintry Copenhagen. With, with no oxygen with, in the room. With, with no oxygen <laughs> and no coffee. Uh, and then you come to Paris with croissant and, and espressos and uh, much more gentle interactions. But what happened in Paris is that all the stakeholders aligned. you got science, civil society, business and politicians feeling the breath right down their neck from all these stakeholders saying, we want change, we are ready to move. And I would argue that 2021, we are in an even more, we're kind of an even more mature post Paris stage. I mean, we are even more prepared for Kunming. We're coming to Kunming armed with, with more machinery than ever before that, that nature is something that we need for our own future. And, and I think this is, again, there, there's no guarantee that we can succeed, of course, but, but at least I think we, we're doing, we're kind of moving in the, in the right direction. So my, my biggest concern here is no longer whether we will be seeing a turnaround in the right direction. My biggest concern is, will it be too late? Are, are, we, are we kind of, starting this this change too late with regards to to some of the irreversible shifts we, we risk seeing but but i think we are definitely at at a turning point yeah that's that's a sobering but optimistic um johan i want to ask you a question that that about researchers desk and and our role and the role of, of civil science or civil service organizations like researchers desk so i mean you go to all these meetings back in my old job at igbp i didn't go to the, i only went to one cop because because after the first one i thought there's no reason for me to go here um i have no impact uh, on this process so what what do you see or how how can groups like researchers desk or other civil society organizations um should we be going to COP, all these COPs, and to Kunming and to other places, and and being there, or or what kind of role do you see? What is a useful role for for yeah. organizations like us? Yeah. So so to begin with, I, I don't think um, initiatives, platforms like the researchers' desk need need to go to the COPs uh, necessarily. 
I think the, the most um, uh, success of, of a platform like the research desk is if it is able to be a credible attractor for, for you know, different minds, thinkers, doers from different walks of life and, and, and be a, an attractor, basically, just like you are doing, and thereby um, drawing in people who, who are at the COP and, and who, who sit behind the scenes, uh, preferably, and, uh, you know, pull in the Nigel toppings of the world, etc., and not necessarily running around yourself. So I think that that's one, one basic reflection. But, but secondly, just to say that one, I mean, the, the, the following statement will certainly come across as a bit boring, but, but I, I really think it's important. We, we are, we have another failure if we look back to, to people like you and me who have been spending uh, the last uh, 40 years professionally struggling in the whole sustainability science field that we, we have um, been taught very early that one should not communicate too, too actively uh, danger or risks or negative results in science. One, one should be careful with, with what we're communicating. And we as academics have moreover not been very good at communicating. And, and we have actually not been rewarded for communicating. So we've been staying away to a large extent. And, and that has been a big mistake. I think we today have a completely new situation. And then one of those is that I'm absolutely convinced myself that to, to succeed in this transformation, we need to keep, can you keep the volume button very high. We need to keep the frequency and the communication from science very intensive. So you need not one researcher's desk, you need thousands of researchers' desks. You need, you need a, kind of a, a very intensive conversation around the whole world, because that's the only way to, to, to make everyone understand that this is important. And, and I, I often joke a bit, it's not a good joke, I realize, because we're in the midst of a disaster with the pandemic. But, but in a country like Sweden, where we, uh, since the pandemic started, we have a press conference every day at two o'clock that the government hosts on the pandemic. Now, that, that's an example of something that is not very attractive to have a, a repeatedly uh, quite boring, basic, uh, predictable information every day on a subject of crisis. But what that has, has meant is that everyone understands that this is important, mm -hmm. that this is something you cannot just uh, turn your back against. And I think that's exactly what we need on the climate crisis, on the ecological crisis. We need to communicate every day, persistently, stubbornly, all the facts on the table, all the time, time and time and time and time and time again. You can never communicate too much. And I think, therefore, that platforms like the researchers' desk are so important because you 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 add one more piece in this in this tremendous you know myriad of of different initiatives. So that that's a very basic, just a very basic role. But then, finally, just to say that what what excites me with initiatives like the researchers' desk is to also be a bit creative. Because um, what, what we're struggling with in the scientific community, as you know, is that there's such an avalanche of new science coming out all the time. And, and uh, it's, it's even for us scientists not easy to keep a pace with. And even if we can keep a pace, it's very complex. It's not easily digestible and certainly not easily communicated. So uh, platforms like the researcher's desk can be beautiful platforms for translation. And, and we need translation more than ever because things are moving so fast. So, so to be a synthesizer, a summarizer, uh, a key messenger, an insight provider, a reflector, uh, you know, that, that you, cannot, you, can, you cannot value that too much, basically. It's, it's just, and we don't have it. When, when you think of it, it's been frustrating for me for, for 20 years at least, if you go to any news site, uh, like if you look at the, the news programs on Swedish public television, for example, anything that happens in politics, anything that happens in economics, anything that happens in industry, you will always get an expert um, journalist giving comments, reflections, insights, uh, key messaging, some kind of comment. 
When it comes to environment, never. Silence. It's just, you, you, you just communicate the information and then you go to the next topic. Why is that? Well, of course, it's because the journalists are not, are not having that capability. You see things changing, actually. I mean, you have Erika Bjerström on Actuel. I mean, you have changes occurring. Actually, interesting, on climate, it's mostly the metrologists have been doing that over the years, uh, flipping it in as a little by sentence when they're giving their weather <laughs> forecasts. But, but, you know, overall, researchers' desk is, is um, I think, an, a golden asset for that um, translating complexity to something that, that we can understand. And, and I think, actually, in that sense, it's useful for, for all of us because, you know, in different disciplines, it's also difficult to, to, to keep pace on what's happening in the deepest insights and in the frontier of science in different disciplines. So it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's great. Yeah. Thanks, Johan. <clears throat> we're, we're, we'll figure out our, our identity is, is, we don't know what we want to be when we grow up. So <laughs> we'll figure that out along the way, I think. <clears throat> now that's helpful. Listen, I want to ask you one more thing before we start uh, letting folks come in and, and ask questions. To the folks that do want to ask questions, there's a zillion of them. Uh, we won't be able to get to everybody, but we'll try to get to as many as we can before before 1300 rolls around. But Johan, we're talking just now about communication, and, and of course you're you're one of the best science communicators ever. Um, <laughs> but you know, and I know you've you've chummed around with Leonardo DiCaprio, um, but really, uh, your film with David Attenborough um, that had to be cool. Can you can you give us just a little bit of you know tell us a story or two about that before we um, before we turn over to questions? Yeah, well, I'm not. I wouldn't use the word cool, perhaps, but um, but it, it, it's 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 a really proud moment in in my academic life. I must be personally honest about that. Um, you know, it's it's um, to to have this opportunity to to translate the planetary boundary science into a, a story that makes it to Netflix, I feel is really important because as you know, I'm passionate. You were part, you are part of that whole scientific journey that you were part of starting in 2007, that we've come to this point that we can now share with the world uh, a story that I hope will feel very compelling and attractive. On, on, on redefining sustainability about prosperity within planetary boundaries. How was it to, to work with um, uh, SDA as, as, uh, as he goes in, in, in working, uh, kind of in, in working mode, uh, Sir, Sir David Attenborough? Well, that was of course fantastic. I mean, I, I have like many of us uh, always had him as, not only as a, as, a, as a hero, but basically as the very reference point on what we mean by, by uh, healthy, beautiful nature. And, uh, and it all started actually with, um, with a pre-launch of the Our Planet series in London. I was invited to give the science talk just before uh, Sir David came up on stage to do a, like, a, like a peak launch of the Netflix Our Planet series. And I gave the, the standard talk that you have been basically leading much of the science on, Kevin, on the Great Acceleration, the Anthropocene, and then landing in the Holocene. And, um, and I, I proposed then that the conclusion is that there are very few people that are born in one geological epoch and that are now alive in another geological epoch. And, and you, Sir David Attenborough, you're one of them. And then he stepped on stage. And that clearly uh, resonated so much. So he, he keeps on coming back to me on that. And he uses that himself, actually, basically all the time now that I'm, I'm one of those few human beings alive on Earth that have been living through two geological epochs. And, uh, and that was the starting point. That, that was the trust we based with each other and uh, and from that on it's been you know quite quite remarkable to 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 be able to do this together with him i i should however though of course um make clear which is a bit unfortunate but it's a reality that because of the pandemic it's been a virtual journey for for him and me and um so he has narrated we have been exchanging on the script i mean i've been part of the script right through the whole film um, producing it with John Clay at Silverback, but he then read the whole text through, and we've been just in, interacting virtually. But um, but of course, it's a, it's a bit of a dream come true to have a science story narrated by 
by SDA by Sir David Attenborough. Oh, well, well done, Johan. We're we're all looking forward to that one. I'm going to be glued to Netflix as soon as it comes out. But well, it's, done. A, it's on fourth of June, so it's fourth next of June. week. Fourth okay. of June. All right, excellent. That I'll clear the decks for that. Um, <laughs> listen, uh, we're now going to open up the the uh, conversation to a few a few questions uh, from from all of you that have been listening. Can I ask you to? I'll call your names. Um, and this is kind of semi-random order, but keep the questions short because we'd like to get as many of them as possible uh, in. And I'm not sure if you can unmute or as as I call out a name, uh, if me or or Toya can unmute. Um, but first on the list, Christian Storm. Christian, what was your question for Johan? Or was it Christoph Storm? Christian Storm. Uh... Now it works. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, I'd like to come back to what you said at the beginning about the climate sensitivity because it's very uh, central. Um, the RSX work package one will be released just three months before Glasgow. I'm not sure whether uh, WG two and three will also be. Uh, so you said the range was narrowed. Uh, apparently, it seems uh, a lower mid value than what the CMIP6 gave. What matrix do exist to be able to tell whether the NDCs are aligned with the agreement or not based on the new science? Yeah, th thanks, Christoph. Well, uh, some others on, on this call may be also better placed to answer that, but I, I foresee actually that we will not have a um, a metrics to 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 check the NDCs against the the new AR6 climate sensitivity in full because it won't be until we get the working group three scenario the updated new RCP SSP scenarios that the new pathway analysis the new 1.5 degrees Celsius analysis based on the latest climate science that we can translate that to the new carbon budgets and the new trajectories of when we need to be at zero. So, so in a way, um, uh, we might end up in a situation where we will be checking the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions in, in Glasgow against the fifth assessment or the, or the 1.5 degrees Celsius report and having the risk of, of it not really meeting the needs uh, after all, but but that's still still to be seen. It's a really good point that you're raising here, and and that, by the way, has been haunting us all the time. I mean, just look at Sweden. Sweden has uh, a, a climate law to reach net zero by 2045, with 85 percent re reduction in emissions within the Swedish borders. But that number is not even aligned with Paris. It it is not even updated with regards to 1.5. It's still a kind of a pre-Paris a pre-Paris number largely. So so it's um, so we we have that challenge following us um, basically continuously. Yeah, along those lines, Johan, the full full climate modeling is is not going to happen for a decision support uh, no. function. Um, you know, maybe we need things like the the C road simulator or the N road simulator that, that you can go and play with climate sensitivity um, yeah. and, and as an educational tool for things like the COP. Um, thanks, Christoph. Uh, next on the list was, was Bu Francien. Bu, if you're available. Hello. There we are. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. thank you. So I, I read the question straight off. So <clears throat> we now know that the cost for the COVID pandemic was underestimated upfront. Now, failure to mitigate the climate crisis expected to cause huge costs. So who is working continuously to update realistic estimates on these costs and communicate this information to the finance sector? Yeah, th thanks, Boo. That's that's a really important question, and um, 
Well, to, to begin with, um, I think to, to start with one of the really decisive points right now, and just to focus on Europe for a moment, is uh, you know the debates going on on how to secure that the, that the recovery package post COVID also aligns with the Green Deal, so that you don't necessarily identify one specific number for the climate recovery or for dealing with the climate crisis, but that all investments align with a zero carbon future. We need to basically, I think, um, and I think it's increasingly understood that, that we cannot place climate in, in, in one initiative, one sector. It simply has to be um, aligned across all investment areas. But, but who is, is doing quantifications of the costs? Well, there, there are many economic research groups and uh, uh, Mark Carney, as you know, is, is today appointed by the UK government in the run up to COP26 to be the, the, the person facilitating on, on, the, on the central banks and the finance sector. And there are many um, climate economic groups one of them I could point to is the Mercator Center on the Global Commons in, in Berlin doing climate economics costings of what it would, let's say, what's that, what are the investments required to take us to a net zero future, which are often translated to estimates of the social cost on carbon. What, what price on carbon do we need to be able to land at zero? I mean, to basically turn things around to what, what's the externality that, that would take us to, to a Paris delivery, which are numbers, as you know, that uh, come way above 100 euros per ton of carbon dioxide and rather, you know, rising quite rapidly, even above 200 to 300 euros as, as we approach that, that uh, ultimate zero point. So I think you could argue today that there are many actors trying to put the numbers behind that mitigation pathway. But I think the number one task today is to ensure that there's an alignment with the, with the recovery investments, uh, alignment with the Paris uh, agreement, with the Paris targets. Yeah, to add on to that, Johan, in the 2008-2009 financial crash, if you look at the investments made after that to get the economy back going again, the, the world average green investment was about 15%. So, so we've got a long, a long way to go uh, in terms of, of bouncing back better. Um, there's certainly a lot we can do. Yeah, and, and um, just to just to I mean just to emphasize also why this is a, a bit almost ridiculous, which is we have the Green Climate Fund, which is the only thing we talk about in terms of climate finance, which uh, uh, sh should have hundred billion US dollars. It isn't really even filled up. Compare that with the. Uh, 10, 11 trillion US dollars, which has already been put behind, uh, you know, dealing with the impacts of the COVID crisis. So, so we're talking about a magnitude of thousand times more money being put on the table on COVID recovery than we've ever spoken on in terms of climate in climate investments. And we're not even able to fill the fund. But it's only it's only peanuts. I mean, it's it's like it's like Bexel Pengar. So so it's so we we have no choice but of course to make everything climate aligned not 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 have a kind of a special investment pocket only for climate i think we have time for one more question or at least we'll try to get one in um, there's there's a participant called admin uh, that had a question admin ah, i can see you actually on the camera would you like to ask your question yes my, thank you my name is mariam and um uh, sometimes you get depressed when it comes to the climate, but there are possibilities. And I wonder if you could speak about your thoughts of the fourth industrial revolution with the internet of things and the sharing economy. How much possibilities do you see in this change as a way to move into a sustainable future? And could you in some way quantify the potential possible outcomes? Mm. Yeah, well, to, to, to start with, uh, just to say how much I recognize this um, challenge that we face in terms of, you know, uh, being confronted with, with risks and, and, and potentially, you know, even potentially catastrophic outcomes, um, and that that can lead to, um, 
you know, a sense of hopelessness. And, um, you know, we talk about depression in, in many cases. I, I'd like to urge us all to, to try and, um, you know, stay away from that negative trajectory as much as we can. And, and just to share with you personally, um, I, I, get, I get angry. Uh, and, and frustrated and, and more um, filled with a sense of, of adrenaline than, than hopelessness. Why? Well, it's because I find it unacceptable. I find it unacceptable for the simple reason that the science has been you know, on the table for so long and we have just more and more evidence for every day that passes. And we also have the solutions and we also can see now that the solutions are scalable and give better outcomes for both economy, humans, health and security. So, so there, is, there is reason, I wouldn't call it hope actually, I would rather call it, you know, kind of an uprising, a sense of, of humane uprising and, and a sense of this being unacceptable. That's why I am at least personally very much uh, in respect of the Fridays for Future youth movement because I, I i think they have such a strong case uh, it's kind of irresponsible for us to to hand over a less livable planet in a situation where we have all the knowledge and all the solutions so it's just to kind of make a plea for us to hold hands in um, in, a, in a kind of a in a, let's call it a fight um you understand what i mean i, I don't mean go out punching anyone but i mean in, in terms of, of the struggle here. Then when it comes to the, the fourth uh, industrial revolution, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right that that is, has huge potential to be part of the solution. But I say only part of, because we also see risks. Um, and, and this is one of the interesting and, and I would call it exciting parts of our transition right now that you know we are very likely very likely actually moving on the long term towards we're in the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era and we're moving towards uh, a clean solar wind driven world economy i mean very likely that that's the trajectory we're moving towards which will be a digital electric modern world now what will happen with that is that the marginal cost of energy will be very low i mean to a large extent almost zero 